talk about a murder that happened up in Connecticut, mob murder, uh, ordered by John Gotti. It's completely unnecessary, if in fact murders are ever necessary. But a guy named Frank Piccola had run things in the southwestern part of Connecticut. That's along the shore as you leave New York and it goes up to Bridgeport, kind of, maybe a little bit past there. Anyway, they got rid of Piccola. They killed him in 1981. And this guy, Tommy DeBreezy, takes over. And he's part of the Gambino crime family. He'd been a longtime associate of Piccola's. He had been with the Gambinos since at least 1966. He was run by, he was in a crew run by Tommy Gambino. In that crew, uh, Petey Castellano, a lot of other guys, George Rimini, was Tony Miguel, who would run Connecticut for the Gambino. Now, when I say he ran Connecticut, he ran, that would be up until, the Connecticut River divides the state. So he had everything west of the Connecticut River. East of the river, really isn't much there. They call it the quiet corner. Is was Rhode Island, kind of Springfield. Parts of Connecticut also were controlled by Springfield mob up in Massachusetts. Anyway, DeBreezy spent 20 years. He built up a hell of an operation, $3 million a year in loan sharking, gambling. He had a nice stretch. It went from Stratford, Connecticut, Bridgeport, up to West Haven, just outside of New Haven. He had a record that went back to 1941 for, you know, just about everything, really. Uh, and it never ended. In 1952, he, they had him loan shark, racketeering, his weapons, conviction, illegal gambling, threatening, suspicion of murder. He was arrested in 1952 for transporting a group of women from Augusta, Georgia, over to Virginia for prostitution. Uh, they got him in 1958 for assault charges. 69, they got him on an federal anti-loan sharking thing. Um, it was the first time that case, the federal case, it was called anti low charging statute, was used in Connecticut against the Breezy and a partner, his Angelo Di Stefano. In 1984, the cops raid his house. Uh, it's a big, huge statewide crackdown on gambling, and, and they bust into his house. He's in jail at the time, and they find 77000 in cash in the guy's living room, uh, three handguns, bedding slips, so he goes jail for that. 1985, he gets indicted by a grand jury for possessing, possessing a 38 and a 44. He's, they were unregistered. He's a convict. He's not supposed to have that thing. So they tossed him away for 24 months on that. When he gets out of prison 18 months later, he decides he's going to slip into retirement. He, he just had enough. He's got a lot of money. He's old. He doesn't need this crap. He starts to cook. Uh, and he's a good cook. The problem is he's five foot nine. He weighed 225 before he started to cook. He threw on 70 more pounds. So he had once been a natty, kind of a slick cooking guy. Now he's a big, you fat guy. He has to walk with a cane. Still, he keeps a low profile. He, he just doesn't want to get involved. And he's half-assed into the whole thing and running this thing. Slowly, this guy, this Miguel guy I told you about, uh, starts hedging in on his bookmaking operations. The police chief uh, of Stanford said that uh, Debris, he had no muscle. His guys were either in jail, they'd gotten old, he was all alone. So for, no one, by the way, really ever put Debris in as a capo with the Gambino crime family. They just figured he was a bookie, you know, on his own. Anyway, J Sammy the Bull Gravano, John Gotti's guy, uh, says that Gotti called him in one day and he says, DeBreezy got to go. And Gotti, uh, Gambino, grabbed him. I said, why? He says, well, because I called him, he didn't want to come in. And then he added something. He also conducted himself improperly when he was in jail. So who knows what, you know, I, I think Gotti probably just made that up as an excuse because he was going to murder this guy. Gotti had to send a message. I'm in charge. I tell you to jump, you jump. And and that was the purpose of ordering this guy. So Gravano says, look, why don't we just demote him? I mean, he's old for Christ's sake. He doesn't want to be a captain and make him a soldier. Guy, no, I want him dead. Uh, when I talk, I want people to listen. So at midday, January 30th, uh, it's a Saturday, DeBreezy goes to his wife's dress shop with his pal Henry Riccio, one-time prize fighter with a long record for loan shark and gambling, stolen goods, blah, blah, blah. And he's also, it's important to point out that Riccio was with Tony Miguel's crew. Uh, the, they go, he tells his wife, we're going to go shopping for food for a big dinner we're going to have on Super Bowl that Sunday. And they leave. And uh, 
he actually had gone shopping because they found a, a, a case of soda in the trunk that had been placed uh, in the back seat, uh, which is where they threw Debussy's body. So Riccio says, I don't know what happened. We went to a Howard Johnson's. We had we had something to eat. Uh, Debussy asked me if a friend of mine could uh, lend him a car. He did. And he told me to wait for him. He'd be right back. On February 5, 1988, Debrisi's frozen by his frozen sip was found in the trunk of the car uh, that he had borrowed. It's found in a Trumbull shopping center. It's a really nice place, Trumbull. He'd been shot six times, six times, twice in the head, four times in the back and the chest. And that, as they say, was that.